These are the notes for AP Calculus on the topics of the derivatives of sine and cosine and the product rule. So let's start with the derivatives of sine and cosine and see where those come from. So the graph here at the top, this is the graph of sine, y equals sine x. And the graph right here, this is the graph of cosine, y equals cosine x. So remember this notation right here means take the derivative of whatever's inside the brackets and let's figure out what the derivative of sine of x would be. So let's first take a look at the slope of sine, which is really like the derivative of sine. Got some key points. So let's start at negative pi, which is right there at about negative 3.14. And if we look at the tangent line there, look at what the tangent line would look like there. Let's try uh, just drawing it here. Right. So if we look like what the, what the tangent would look like there, about like that, right? Well, what would the slope of that tangent line be? Well, the slope, it's hard to tell exactly what it is, but it turns out it's exactly negative one. Now let's take a look at the slope right here at negative pi over 2, right? the slope of the tangent line. So here the tangent line would look something like that. The slope of that line, you can tell that one would be 0. And 0, the slope of the tangent line right there, that would be exactly positive 1, it's at 45 degree angle there. And at pi over 2 right there, so the tangent line again, you can tell it's zero. And over here at pi, so the tangent line right there is negative. So let's compare those slopes or derivatives of sine with the value of cosine. Or when I say the value, I'm talking about the y value or the y coordinate. So at negative pi, about right there, you can see the y coordinate of cosine is negative 1. At negative pi over 2 right there, the y coordinate of cosine is 0. At x equals 0, the y coordinate of cosine is 1. At x equals pi over 2, the y coordinate of cosine is 0. And at x equals pi, that y value of cosine is negative 1. So you can see those are exactly the same as the slopes of sine. So that means if we want the derivative or slope of sine, it's actually just going to be determined by cosine. So this equals cosine x. This is not true just at the key points we looked at, but at every single point along the sine graph, its slope is determined by the y value of cosine. Now let's look at the other way around. Let's take a look at the slope of cosine and compare that with the value of sine in order to determine what's the derivative of cosine. So let's look at the slope of cosine at some these same key points. So the slope of cosine and the slope of the tangent line right there at negative pi equals to be zero. The slope of cosine at negative pi over two, that would be positive one. The slope of cosine at zero, see the slope of the tangent line would be zero. Slope of cosine over here at pi over 2 would be negative 1. And the slope of cosine at pi, you see, would be 0. Now let's compare that with the y values of sine.
So now we'll get the y coordinates of sine at negative pi over 2. Sorry, negative pi, you can see that would be 0. At negative pi over 2 right there, that would be negative 1. At 0, you can see that would be 0. At pi over 2, would be 1. And at pi, that would be 0. So you're comparing these values, you can see, well, they're not exactly the same. But what it is, you can see at the, at the negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, when cosine, the slope of cosine is 1, sine is negative 1. And at pi over 2, when the slope of cosine is negative 1, the value of sine is 1. So here, the sine seems to be giving you the opposite of the derivative of cosine. So that means the derivative of cosine would not be sine, it would be the opposite of sine, negative sine. So that's just showing you where those formulas come from, come from. And you want to have those memorized. And we're going to use them in conjunction with the next thing we're going to look at is the product rule. So remember in math, product refers to the result of multiplication. So remember when you have functions that are added and subtracted from each other, the sum and difference rules say that we can take the derivative of each one separately. However, if you have two functions multiplied together, in this case, f of x times g of x, you cannot just take the derivatives of them separately. So this says, in order to take the derivative of one function times another, here's the pattern you follow. You take the derivative of the first function, f prime of x, is the derivative of f of x, times the second function as it is, so we leave g of x alone, and then plus the first function as it is, f of x, times the derivative of the second function, derivative of g of x is g prime of x. So that's the pattern we follow when you have two functions multiplied together. So it says find the derivative of each expression. So here, since it's y equals, we'll write the derivative as the rate of change notation as dy dx. And first we have to decide how we split it up. We've got 3x to the 4th times sine of x. So the way to split this one is 3x to the 4th, that'll be like our f of x, times sine of x will be like our g of x. So let's follow the pattern of the product over here. So we take the derivative of the first one, the derivative of 3x to the 4th is 12x cubed, times the second function as it is, times sine of x, and then plus the first function as it is, which is 3x to the fourth, times the derivative of sine of x is, we just learned, cosine. That's it. That's our derivative using the product rule. You could factor out a 3x cubed there, but it's not really necessary in this case since we're not doing anything else with the derivative. All right, let's take a look at the next one here. We've got h of x equals 7x minus x squared cosine x. So in order to take the root of h of x, well, first we'd write it as h prime of x. But notice here we've got a minus sign right there. So what that means is we can take the derivative of these separately. Remember what the sum and difference rules say, when the terms are added or subtracted, you can take the derivative of those separately. So let's take the derivative of 7x, which, well, that doesn't require the product rule there, because 7 is just a constant, the derivative of 7x is just 7. But now, when we want to take the derivative of negative x squared times cosine x, that's where we'll need the product rule. And you can do this in a couple ways. One way, if you leave the negative out in front, if you put a negative and then you put a giant parenthesis like this, and treat the first function as x squared and the second one as cosine x. However, then you'd have to distribute the negative out, and it's actually a little bit easier if instead of doing that, what we do is just take that negative and treat it as part of the first function. So f of x. Instead of saying it's just x squared, we'll say it's negative x squared. And g of x will be cosine x. So negative x squared times cosine x, let's use the product rule on that. So derivative of negative x squared is negative 2x, using the power rule times second one, cosine x as it is. Now normally in the product rule it's plus x. But what is plus is the first one as it is, which is negative x squared. And that's really, it looks unnecessary, right? Having a negative number like that looks kind of weird. So we don't really see that plus somewhere. 
because the first term is negative. So it's just the second, first one as it is, negative x squared. And then times we just learned the derivative of cosine x is the opposite of sine. So it's negative sine x. And just a little bit of simplifying we can do here. So h prime x is just 7. This term is about as simple as we get. Negative 2x times cosine x. But here you can bring the negative out in front with a negative x squared and make it positive x squared times the sine of x. Now let's take a look at what would happen if you had three functions multiplied. So this is the product rule for three functions. But it follows a similar pattern if we have f of x times g of x times h of x. Here's the pattern it follows. You take the derivative of the first one, f prime x, and you leave the second and third ones alone, g of x and h of x. And then plus, this time you take the derivative of the second one, which is g prime of x, and you leave the first and the third one's alone, f of x and h of x. And then plus, now you leave the first two alone, f of x and g of x, and you take the derivative of the third one, h prime of x. So let's see how this works for this example problem. It says differentiate each expression. Remember, differentiate just means take the derivative of, because differentiation is the process of finding the derivative. So since it's y equals, so we'd write our derivative as dy dx. And we first take the derivative of the first one. So let's put, we're going to split up to 4x cubed plus 5 times cosine x times sine x. So the derivative of 4x cubed plus 5 is 12x squared. The derivative of 5 is 0. That's a constant by itself. Then we leave the second two alone. So we leave cosine x and sine x. And then plus... Now we leave the first one alone, so 4x cubed plus 5, and now we take the derivative of the second one, g prime x, the derivative of cosine we learned is negative sine x, and then we leave the third one alone, h of x, so we leave sine x alone. And then plus, now we leave the first two alone, so we leave f of x and g of x, 4x cubed plus 5, and sine x, and cosine x alone. And then we take the derivative of sine, which we learned is cosine. And now let's just simplify that. So 12x squared times cosine x times sine x. And here to simplify this, we can bring this negative out in front. We don't need that one, so it makes it minus. cubed plus 5. Then we have sine x times sine x. That's sine of x squared. And then plus, then we have 4x cubed plus 5. And then we have cosine x times cosine x. That's cosine of x squared. So there's the derivative using the rule for three functions, or the triple front rule. And the same pattern would hold if you had four functions multiplied together, or five functions in each term, you'd have the derivative of one, and the other terms as they are. All right, now let's take a look at a problem where we're finding the derivative with and without using the product rule. And then we're going to compare our answers to ensure they're actually the same. So you can start with either one. Let's say we start with the product rule. Okay, so with the product rule, we'll just start off by taking the derivative right away. So f prime of x, and we'll treat 3x minus 5, 3x to the fourth minus 5, that's our first function, times x squared minus 4x plus 2 is our second function. So we'll take the derivative of the first one, so the derivative of 3x to the fourth minus 5 is 12x squared, 12x cubed, sorry, or negative 5 is 0. 
So remember the first one times the second one as it is, x squared minus 4x plus 2. And then plus, first one as it is, create x to the fourth minus 5 times the derivative of the second one. The derivative of x squared is 2x, the derivative of negative 4x is negative 4, and the derivative of 2 constant by itself is 0. And then to simplify this, we can just multiply it out and see if we have any like terms. So if we distribute out the 12x cubed times x squared, we do 12x to the fifth. 12x cubed times negative 4x is negative 48x to the fourth. 12x cubed times 2 is 24x cubed. And then let's go ahead and multiply out the other two binomials here to see if we have like terms. So 3x to the fourth times 2x is 6x to the fifth. So we'll put underneath the 12x to the fifth, so it's easy to combine our like terms there. 3x to the fourth times negative 4 is negative 12 to the fourth. Then distribute the negative 5 times 2x is negative 10x. There's no like term on that, so I'll just leave it off to the side. And negative 5 times negative 4 is a positive 1. Okay. So 12x to the fifth plus 6x to the fifth is 18x to the fifth. Negative 48x to the fourth and negative 12x to the fourth is negative 60x to the fourth. Plus 24x cubed minus 10x plus 1. Now let's try it without the prodigal. So if you didn't know what the product rule was, you didn't know how to take the derivatives of two functions multiply together, what you'd have to do first before you take the derivative is just multiply it out. So this is still f of x, it's not the derivative yet. So f of x, well, if we distribute this out, 3x to the fourth times x squared would be 3x to the sixth. 3x to the fourth times negative 4x would be negative 12x to the fifth. 3x to the fourth times 2 would be 6x to the fourth. And then should the negative 5 times x squared would be negative 5x squared. Negative 5 times negative 4x would be positive 20x. And negative 5 times 2 would be negative 10. And now that it's all multiplied out, since so now that the terms are just added subtracted, we can just use the power on each to take the derivative of each of them separately. So f prime of x, now it's their derivative. 6 times 3 is 18. Reduce the x1 by 1, x to the fifth. 5 times negative 12, negative 60. Reduce the x1 by 1, x to the fourth. 4 times 6, 24. Reduce the power by 1, x cubed. 2 times negative 5, negative 10, x. The root of 20, x is 20. And the root of constant by itself is 0. So take a look there. So notice we've got the exact same answer we've got here. So they're both correct. So what this shows you is just because you can use the product rule doesn't mean that's always the most efficient way to find the root. If it's just polynomials like this, you might be better off multiplying it out first and avoiding the product rule. It might save you actually a little bit of time. Now, it's different with trig functions and they're multiplying out. It doesn't really help you. But if it's just polynomials like this, then actually that can be helpful. Now let's take a look at a problem where they're finding the equations of the tangent and normal lines of the function. We get an x5. So remember, the two things we need to write the tangent line are the point of tangency and the slope. And the easiest one usually to find is the point of tangency. We can just plug in pi for x, and that'll give us our y coordinate. So if we plug in pi, f of pi, that's 3 pi squared minus pi times the sine of pi. Let's see, the sine of pi, well, pi is right over here on the inner circle. That's the point negative 1, 0, and remember sine is the y coordinate, so sine of pi is 0, and that wipes out this whole thing, so we just get 0. So we plug in pi for x, we got 0 for y, there's our point of tangency. So now we also need the slope of the tangent line, and remember the slope comes from the derivative. The derivative gives you the slope of the function, or the slope of the tangent line. So let me take the derivative.
derivative, you can see we've got 3x squared minus x times sine x. And you could distribute out the sine x times both of these, but that's actually going to make it more difficult. Then you actually have two product rules you have to use rather than just one. So let's just take the derivative right here using the product rule. So we have the derivative of the first one. The derivative of 3x squared is 6x. The derivative of negative x is negative 1. The derivative of the first one times the second one as it is, sine x. Plus the first one as it is, 3x squared minus x. Times the derivative of the second one, the derivative of sine we learned today is cosine. Oops. That should have been a x there to start with. Well, we're going to plug in pi as our next step, as you will have myself. Sorry about that. There we go. Now let's go ahead and substitute in pi, because this is the slope for any tangent line on the graph. We want it specifically at our point of tangency, so now we substitute in pi for x. So it'd be 6 pi minus 1 times the sine of pi plus pi squared minus pi times the cosine of pi. And then the sine of pi we saw is zero. So since that's zero, that wipes out that entire term. But the cosine of pi is the x coordinate there. The cosine of pi is negative one. So if we distribute out that negative one, that's going to change the negative pi right there to be a positive pi. And I'll change the three positive 3 pi squared to be a negative 3 pi squared. They look a little weird, but that's just a number with e in terms of pi, so that's the slope of the tangent. Now, let's go ahead and write the tangent line first, and then we'll write down the normal line. So the tangent line, whenever we're using point-slope form, y minus the y coordinate, but the y coordinate is just zero here, so you don't really need minus zero, that's, uh, you just write y equals, the same as y minus zero, equals the slope, we just figured out, is pi minus three pi squared times x minus the x coordinate, x minus the x coordinate of point tangency is pi. Now, if we take a look at that, there's something not quite right about it, and what it is is, this whole thing is the slope, but if you leave it like this, it's only going to look like the negative 3 pi squared is the slope, not this pi. So what you have to do is make sure you put it in parentheses to show that whole thing is the slope. That slope divided by the x minus y. And then for the normal line, remember that it still goes to the point of tangency, but it's perpendicular to the tangent line. So it still goes to the, this point, so it'd still be y minus 0, or just y equals. But in order to be perpendicular to the tangent line, we have to make the slope here the opposite reciprocal. So let's first make it the reciprocal by writing as 1 over pi minus 3 pi squared. And then to make it the opposite, you could do one of two things. You could either put the negative there, or you could distribute the negative on the denominator and make it a negative pi and positive 3 pi squared. And then that's times x minus the x coordinate, which is y. Here we don't need parentheses around, so we could, because it's just, it's just one fraction. So that whole thing gets distributed times the x minus pi. This Now let's take a look at a couple that are in general notation here. So it says find h prime of x and h prime of 1 given all this information about f and g. So initially it might not be obvious why we need all this information until we actually get to work it out the problem. So let's start with finding h prime of x. There's h of x. First thing to notice, we've got a minus sign right there. So that means we can take the derivative of each of these separately. To take the derivative of 3f of x, we don't need the product rule there because 3 is just a constant. When you have to take the derivative of this constant out front, it just stays there. So that stays there. And then the derivative of f of x, we write as f prime of x. So we're done with that one. Now you could use the product rule on this 3 and f of x, but it's not necessary. Because the derivative of 3 is just 0, and that's going to wipe out the first term anyway. All right, now let's use the product rule on the negative 4x squared times g of x. So the product on that, we have the derivative of the first function. Derivative of negative 4x squared is negative 8x times 
times the second one as it is, g of x. Normally in the product rule we'd have plus, but the first function as it is is negative, so you won't see that plus sign. So it's the plus, the first one as it is is negative 4x squared, and then times the derivative of the second one, the derivative of g of x, we write as g of x. So that's h prime of x, that's the first thing we're asked to find. And then we're asked to find h prime of 1. So now you just substitute in 1, wherever there's an x, it would be 3 half prime of 1, minus 8 times 1, times g of 1, minus 4 times 1 squared, times g prime of 1. And that's when we start looking at the information up at the top to help us out. So h prime of 1 be 3 times f prime of 1, they tell you here is negative 3. Negative 8 times 1 is negative 8. And then g of 1, they tell you at the top here, is negative 1. And then 1 squared is 1 times negative 4 is negative 4. Times g prime of 1, they tell you, is 4. And now it's just a matter of using your order of operations correctly to simplify this. So you do multiplication first, 3 times the negative 3 is negative 9. Negative 8 times the negative 1 is positive 8. Negative 4 times 4 is negative 16. So you get negative 9 plus 8 is negative 1, minus 16 gives you negative 7. So there's a second part of answer, which part 1. Now, let's look at the next one here for h of x. So I'm going to find h prime of x. So again, you see there's a plus sign in between there, which means we can take the derivative of each of these separately. And there's another plus sign here, so we can take the derivative of the 7 separately as well. So let's start with the first one. We've got 2g of x f of x. Well, do you think we need the triple product rule there? Well, because the 2 is a constant, we don't. If it was 2x, then we would have to use the triple product. But well, we don't here because we can just treat the first one as 2g of x times the second one is f of x. So using the product rule now, we take the derivative of the first one, and we re remember the constant multiple rule says when you have a constant in front of a function, when you take the derivative, it just stays there. So 2 times the derivative of g of x, g prime of x, times the second one as it is, f of x, and then plus the first one as it is, 2g of x, times the derivative of the second one, the derivative of f of x, we write it f of x. So that takes care of the product rule on the first one, and then we have a plus sign. But now we can either have f of x times g of x. And this one, we do need the product rule as well, because we've got 5x times g of x. If it was just 5g of x, we wouldn't need it. So using the product rule on this one, we've got 5x as our first function. And g of x is our second function. So we take the derivative of the first one. Derivative of 5x is 5 times the derivative of, so it times the second one as it is, g of x as it is. And then plus the first one as it is, 5x. times the derivative of the second one, the derivative of g of x is g prime of x. And then finally we've got plus 7. We take the derivative of the 7, but the derivative of 7, the constant by itself, is 0. So now let's go ahead and plug in 1. So that was the first part of answer for h prime of x. So we'll have 2 times g prime of 1 times f of 1 plus 2 times g of 1 times f prime of 1 plus 5 times g of 1 plus 5 times 1 times g prime of 1. And now we start using the values they give you. So 2 
times u prime of 1, they tell you right here, is 4. Times f of 1, they tell you right here, is 2. Plus 2 times g of 1, they tell you right here, is negative 1. Times f prime of 1, is negative 3. Plus 5 times g of 1, I'll tell you right here, is negative 1. Plus 5 times 1 is just 5. Times g prime of 1, and right here it's 4. So you can also use our R of operations now, and we'll have a multiplication before on the addition subtraction. So we have. 2 times 4 is 8 times 2 is 16. Negative 1 times negative 3 times 2, the negatives cancel, that's 3 times 2 is 6. 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. 5 times 4 is 1. So h in front of 1, 16 plus 6 is 22, minus 5 is 17, plus 20 is 37. And that includes the notes for the calculus on the topics of the derivatives of sine and cosine and the product.